In this lesson, we're going to look at uh, comparing plant and animal cells. Now, invention of the microscope in the mid-1600s made it possible for scientists to look at the matter that made up all living cells, right? All living things. So uh, Robert Hooke, a uh, scientist, pretty much was one of the first to actually describe um, what a cell actually was back in the 1600s. Um, by observing tissues of cork sample as we have in the um, in this photo Now cells are considered the basic building block of life. So anything that is really made of um, that is living Right uh, anything that is living is made up of cells tiny little particles, right? Uh, so when we looked at matter all matter was made up of tiny little particles that were ultimately known as atoms but when we're um, looking at things that are considered living these tiny particles are considered cells. So all living organisms, as I've said, uh, made up of cells. Cells now, one of the important, uh, important response, one of the responsibilities that they need is to be able to take in nutrients from their environment and to be able to release the waste back out into the environment, right? So they take in whatever they need, right? The nutrients, water, everything um, that they need, and then whatever they want to get rid of, right, are waste. Right? They want to make sure they're able to uh, release it back out into the environment. All cells uh, contain everything that is needed uh, to live and grow, as we're going to talk about um, within the, um, the nucleus. Uh, one of the important organelles of a cell contains DNA. Which brings us to the uh, cell theory. Uh, so we know that pretty much all living things are made up of cells. And that's... Uh, really one of the more important aspects. So, now, two scientists, uh, individual papers that they uh, both published, Schleiden kind of focusing on animal cells, Schwann focusing more on plant cells, uh, and they both stated uh, individually that all living sing things are composed of um, living cells, right? So that kind of just leads to the basis of why we say that all living things have these tiny pieces, right, that we call cells. Uh, now, continuing on that note, we've got pretty much um, years later, a uh, scientist by the name of uh, Virchow, he pretty much extended the cell theory, something that is uh, referred to um, as a biogenic law, uh, and it pretty much states that all living cells arise from pre-existing cells. Now, what does that mean? Well, Let's take, for example, a cell. And if we look at a cell, this cell, what's going to happen is it's going to get larger. Okay. And ultimately, it starts to pinch at either end and it eventually forms two completely new cells, but these two are, are exactly identical okay. they're exactly identical to the initial cell. So in other words, cells don't just spontaneously appear. Right? So for a cell to, to be in existence, it must have come from somewhere. Right? And there's nothing there's no such thing as really magic. Right? So these cells, for them to appear, they have to come from somewhere. So if we think of, if we think of the notion of a, of, a, of a baby being conceived, it originally starts from a sperm and an egg uniting and, fertil and, and that sperm fertilizing the egg. And ultimately, that one fertilized egg, uh, known as the zygote, uh, undergoes this process of duplication until it eventually forms this fetus. You know, and eventually, you know, it's ready for, um, uh, you know, to come to term at the end of, uh, of a pregnancy. So, in other words, really for that to have existed, that baby didn't just miraculously appear. It came from that, you know, one type of cell being the egg cell and the other type of cell being the sperm cell. All right. Um, now, we, and, and that's pretty much that's a different type of replication uh, as we'll look at when we uh, look at something called meiosis. But now, in terms of this, seeing this as well, um, think of a cut, right? You cut yourself and all of a sudden, you know, a week later, it starts to heal and it starts to scab, whatever. 
and it replaces it. So once the scab kind of has completely healed and it kind of falls off, underneath it, all the cells have been replaced. But how have they been replaced? They've been replaced by the pre-existing cells that, are, that have already been there, that were not involved with the, uh, the cut. Okay, and finally, cells are the basic building units of life. So for life to exist, we've got cells that continue to duplicate itself and eventually form whole systems, um, as uh, we will be talking about in a future lesson. Development of the electron microscope allowed biologists to view detailed information about different cell parts and their functions. Uh, so now the, we're looking at uh, the invention of objects uh, or of tools, scientific tools, that enable us to be able to view something so tiny as a cell, right? And eventually this led to the invention of the electron microscope, which has the ability to produce images that are a thousand times more detailed than that of the light microscope, right? In a classroom, you're going to use a light microscope. Um, but if you're lucky enough to ever work in a, uh, in a biology lab in the university level, um, and of course, maybe if you're working on your master's or whatnot, you'll be able to probably get a chance to actually work with an electron microscope, which is pretty cool. Now, cell parts and their functions. All living things, as we've said, are made up of cells, right? Our body is made up of anywhere between 10 trillion and about 100 trillion cells. Okay, the cell is uh, considered, according to the cell theory, um, so all cells pretty much are the basic unit of life. So in order to have life, you need cells. So cells do not just appear from someplace. They actually, cells actually come from pre-existing cells, right? So when you, re when you cut yourself, the cells that replace that cut are cells that have been replicated and duplicated from the cells that are around the damaged area. Uh, cells contain smaller parts within that are called organelles. In humans, we've got organs, right, which are the parts that are within us, right, your stomach, the heart, lungs, all that. These are organs. But with actual, the actual cell, right, so if we're going at that small of a level, these parts that are found within cells are called organelles. So organelles have special functions that maintain all life processes of the cell. So some of the processes taken in nutrients, movement, growth, response to stimuli. Um, re response to stimuli pretty much um, you step on something sharp and you react to it. That sharpness that you're feeling, right? That you stepping on something sharp uh, and feeling that pain, that's considered a stimulus. Um, as a doctor, you know, pricks your finger with the needle, you feel it, right? That's a stimulus, something that, that stimulates a, some kind of a response out of you. Uh, exchange of gases. Um, right, so oxygen, carbon dioxide, all that stuff. Not only do we breathe that stuff in, but even our cells actually take that stuff in and, and release them. Uh, waste removal and reproduction. And when we're talking about reproduction. Uh, ultimately, we're going to be looking at um, the process of mitosis, as we're going to look at in a uh, future lesson, where mitosis is how cells duplicate one another, right? Um, and meiosis, which is how um, spermatogonia. Uh, cells duplicate, right? How do sperm cells form? How do um, the female, how does a female egg um, re, uh, produce itself? Okay, and these are some of the uh, special functions that are, that organelles actually have. Now, two types of cells, right? plant cell, and over on this side, animal cell. Really, one of the most unique uh, differences between these two is the fact that animal cells are rounded. Plant cells, on the other hand, a little more brick-shaped, uh, and we're gonna see that um, as we actually go through actually drawing um, an actual plant and animal cell. So, structures and organelles of cells. Most structures and organelles are the same in both plant and animal cells. Some structures and organelles actually differ between plant and animal cells. So there are many, many uh, organelles that are actually common between both plant and animal. As you saw, shape-wise between plant and animal is very, very distinct. But there are some organelles that are actually found only within um, plant cells or that are only found in animal cells, as we're going to look at. 
Now, cell membrane, all cells have a cell membrane which acts as a barrier around the cell. Within this membrane pretty much is where we house all the organelles, right? So it pretty much, it's kind of like the skin, right? Like our skin, eh, eh, you know, it protects and, and some of the bones protect the inner organs of us as, as humans. But for plant, uh, sorry, for plant cells and animal cells, that membrane is what kind of keeps everything inside. Okay, so uh, this is pretty much the, one of the first, I guess, organelles you can think of um, of the actual cell itself. And uh, so pretty much its responsibility really is it's a barrier. It, it kind of prevents material just from randomly coming in and out of uh, the cell. It's actually made up of what we call a double layer of lipids, right? A uh, lipid is a uh, fat-like molecule that does not dissolve in water. So it's got what we call the hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. Okay, so what we have pretty much the hydrophilic, right? This is water-loving, right? And hydrophobic end, right? Which is this inside part, which is pretty much scared of water, right? Water hating, so to speak. Uh, fatty acids. Okay, and this is what we call the phospholipid bilayer. It's a two region, um, uh, pretty much protection, outer coating, outer, outer barrier, so to speak. So, cell membrane allows different substances to move throughout it. Okay, so now, one process for moving substance across the cell membrane is called diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of a substance or some kind of dissolved particle, uh, which are known as solutes, across a membrane, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So if you look at here, we've got the cell membrane here in the middle, this yellow part. Notice the uh, phospholipid bilayer, there are two layers, right? The hydrophobic region on the inside, uh, hydrophobic uh, fatty acid, and the hydrophilic outer ends, right? Those are the ones towards the outside. So what happens is we've got a whole bunch of substances, right? All these dissolved particles, these solutes. So notice how many, we've got a lot of them here, nothing on this side. So what's gonna happen is really, as that point says here, that diffusion is the movement from an area that is highly concentrated to an area that is low concentrated. So here, the concentration is high. Here, the concentration of solute particles are, is low. So what happens is these particles here are going to actually want to move in that direction, as we're going to see here. So particles are going to move right, in that direction towards from high concentration to low concentration until we've reached what we call uh, an equilibrium. We've reached uh, an equilibrium between both sides. Right, so think of uh, uh, equilibrium, uh, oops, wrong eye, <laughs> wrong, oh, that's the eye there, that should be, okay, so uh, reaches an equilibrium equal on both sides in terms of solute particles uh, on both the um, outer end and inner end, I and mean, you're going to look, we're going to expand more on that in, uh, in the future um, video where we're going to actually talk about how we can actually go pretty much against the so-called grain. So in other words, if we're looking at this, right, the, uh, the concentration is going really in, as this arrow shows, in this direction here. Because it's going from high, as we said before, to an area that is low until it is equal on both sides. So as that uh, first part of the cell that we're going to look at um, is the Double the phospholipid bilayer called the cell membrane. It's a double layer. Uh, excuse, I'm using a uh, tablet uh, to show it. Um, so there we go. There's our cell membrane, uh, and pretty much it's the outer barrier. So it's uh, I like to, the analogy I like to use is it's kind of like the bouncer at the club, right? It uh, keeps an eye out on who's coming in and who's going out 
Um, so, and the same thing goes with, um, with the actual cell. Now, let's um, look down at the cell membrane now of that of a plant. And I'm actually going to use green because, as we've shown before, with the animal cell, it's a lot more rounded. As I've said before, uh, the cell membrane pretty much, um, or between the uh, um, plant and animal cell, one of the unique uh, differences is the fact that th is their, their, their outside shape, right? So we know that the, um, with the plant cells, more brick-like, uh, you know, straight edges because, well, think of uh, parts of a plant, right? Think of the, um, the stem of a plant, right? So pretty much, um, and this is really what we call, it's not really their membrane, but it's actually considered their cell wall. And so it's a thick cell wall, and that's a unique part only in plant cells. So we have the cell wall. Right, and the cell wall, pretty much, as we said, pretty much only in plant cells, uh, some bacteria, some fungi, and some algae actually have cell walls. Now, the cell wall, very rigid frame around the cell, provides strength, provides protection, provides support um, for the plant. But also on the inside is this double layer membrane. So the cell membrane, also in a plant cell, is just found on the inside. And so I'm just going to do the inner... Um, membrane part. So think of this green part here being part of the phospholipid bilayer. So this layer here will be considered the cell membrane of the plant cell. So notice here, plant cell, right? A little more square in shape, uh, edges, while the animal cell is considered very round. So next part that we're going to look at um, with uh, the um, with both cells is really everything that's on the inside, right? So really all this inner space here, right, and is where we will house all the organelles, right? So within all this space is the is where the organelles. But think of it almost kind of like a swimming pool, right? And within here. Right? We have something called pretty much um, cytoplasm. And this cytoplasm is pretty much um, is this jelly-like substance um, that fills the inside of the cell and it actually surrounds uh, all the organelles. So and it pretty much it's within the cytoplasm that we actually contain the nutrients that are required uh, by the cell to actually carry on all its, of its life processes. So... We will label the cytoplasm later just because we're going to be putting in um, our organelles. So now we start off with the uh, cell membrane. And w within the cell membrane, as we said, is the cytoplasm. Plant cells have a cell wall outside of the cell membrane. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to actually start off with one of the more important um, we can't say the more important because they're all equally important in their own way, um, is the nucleus. And the nucleus pretty much is also a double layer membrane. Okay, and it's found in both cells. So the nucleus is considered the control center of the cell, right? It controls all the activities in the cell, uh, growth, uh, reproduction, uh, and whatnot. Uh, so now the nucleus, as we said, pretty much is it's a nuclear membrane or uh, a nuclear envelope. So here we have the nucleus, right? So and pretty much the outside part of the nucleus is really the nuclear envelope or the uh, the nuclear membrane. Okay, and pretty much it also has pores within it. Uh, one thing I didn't say about the cell membrane uh, is very porous. It's what we call a selectively permeable, right? Selectively permeable. Okay, and selectively permeable means it is very selective to allow, right? permeate uh, throughout the cell. So it's selective on what it lets in and what it lets out, right? So really tiny particles are easy to come in and out of the cell, while things that are slightly bigger require channels um, 
to actually make its way in and out of the cell as you're going to see um, in a future video uh, on that. Okay, and the same thing goes with the nuclear membrane. Um, so we're pretty much within the nucleus, right? In this nucleus is where pretty much all the DNA, um, you know, all the DNA can be found uh, of, a, pl of a, uh, a plant cell or of a, uh, an animal cell, right? And this pretty much is considered the blueprint of, uh, of life for that, uh, that organism. Right? So everything is there. It, it tells you everything that it needs to almost reproduce that cell. So all the most important information, uh, information that you're going to learn in a future lesson on genetics, right? when we're talking about certain traits and you know, hair color and eye color and, and, and other characteristics that are encoded within the, um, the DNA. Okay? Uh, within here also, uh, you will find something called a nucleolus, really dark um, piece and we won't talk too much about the nucleolus and within here as we said pretty much uh, it's you know granular fibers I'm trying to show it right and so in the form of chromatin and ultimately during um, uh, we call it during uh, cell division and during mitosis right this chromatin starts off with a centromere Right? Eventually, these co start to coil, right? start to coil up right? and thicken, so it become more visible, and you'll be able to see these stages during um, mitosis. And what happens is it does an exact duplicate of itself on the other side. So what happens is it forms almost like this X shape here, which enables us pretty much, it'll cut it in half, to allow one part of the genetic code, which is an exact duplicate on both sides, to go in one cell and one to go in another. And like I said, we are going to see that uh, in a future lesson when we're talking about cell division. So let's, uh, let's get rid of some of this stuff here so it doesn't get in the way. Okay, so uh, well, let's uh, draw it now on our plant cell down here. Let's draw that control center because both plant and animal cells have this control center, um, which is pretty much very important to the cell. And as we said, it's a double layer with the nucleolus, and also it um, it also has its um, what do you call it uh, chromatin, right? The uh, granular. Uh, which makes up pretty much DNA, and DNA stands for deoxyribose, deoxyribonucleic acids. And I don't really expect my students to really know that, but again, if you're, uh, you know, you want to know kind of thing, uh, just look it up. Uh, deoxyribo. Uh, now, slow. Actually, let me say it slower. Deoxy. So you sound it out. Deoxyribonucleic acids, and that's really what they are. And you'll we'll learn more about um, DNA and its uh, and the sequences. Um, in a um, pretty much in a future video, right? So next, what we're going to look at is pretty much stemming from the uh, the nucleus. Okay, is pretty much um, a almost like a like a passageway, right? Almost like a passageway. It really pretty much interconnected uh, tubules that help carry uh, material throughout the um, throughout the cell, right? Oops, let me use a blue. Okay, so a little passageway uh, on very much stemming from the uh, the nucleus, and there are two distinct types, and I'm just gonna you know draw them. Ooh, they're gonna look the same with one unique region or one unique characteristic. Uh, so as we said, the endoplasmic reticulum organelle, a uh, series of these interconnected uh, tubules that help carry material throughout the cell. So it's almost kind of like a subway system. Um, you know, some kind of like, almost like a hallway, so to speak. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw little dots, okay? Little dots on one of the sets, okay? So these dots, are called ribosomes. Okay, so these dots here are called ribosomes. 
Okay, so uh, these ribosomes, pretty much, they're small, they're dense looking organelles. You can actually see them in, uh, barely in the, uh, with a light compound light microscope. Uh, and they're attached to this endoplasmic reticulum. So let me uh, actually label that so you know what, it, what I'm talking about. This is considered the endoplasmic cannot do eyes with this tablet. Endoplasmic, it's a, there's a little bit of a lag on it. Reticulum. Okay, so we'll use the, uh, the letters ER to shorten it. Never just use ER. Uh, your, t your teacher, if you're like me, I want it written at least once and then uh, show me uh, the, the, uh, the point form. But if you've got, you've got two sets of endoplasmic reticulum, Okay, um, you've got this one set that's got these dark, dense objects. And you've got the ones that do not. These ones with the, um, the dots are considered the rough, right? Because they're bumpy, right? They've got ribosomes that, uh, that make them uh, bumpy, right? So these um, rough endoplasmic reticulum, this is involved with the production of proteins, right? So it gives it this rough appearance with the, uh, the ribosomes. Uh, and pretty much the ribosomes here, right? These dots is pretty, are, is pretty much the site in which proteins that the body needs or that cell needs um, actually get assembled. And we're going to talk about that in a uh, future, um, future video and we're going to talk about more on the uh, biology on a senior level. Now, these, this smooth one here is also considered uh, an endoplasmic reticulum, but this is considered the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So it's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum um, and pretty much these are uh, pretty much known for uh, the production of fats and oils. Now they're smooth right, in nature because they do not contain these ribosomes. Okay, so let's go down and actually put these in to the, um, the plant cell now. Okay, so also the plant cell contain these smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum. So let's just draw them in. Right, this passageway. Right, we're gonna draw a second one. Right, and as we said, one of them is gonna be the rough because they will contain the ribosomes, right? Protein manufacturing um, tubules, or is a rough endoplasmic reticulum, right? Uh, assembly of proteins here with these ribosomes, um, and here, as we said, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum uh, associated with the production of fats and oil. So we know so far both plants and animal cells have the same these same organelles. Okay. So now, moving on from these, and I'm going to use, uh, yeah, let's use purple here. You'll find something that may look like stacks of you know, pancakes or whatnot. Uh, and these are considered, and they've, they've got a couple of names, Golgi bodies or Golgi apparatus. Okay. And uh, I'm going to refer to it as Golgi bodies, uh, just to kind of make things um, a little bit simpler here. So now these are pretty much the, um, it's the site of packaging, right? So what happens is these Golgi bodies are going to receive um, the proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum, right? And primarily the rough endoplasmic reticulum, right? So proteins are going to make their way in here. Right, let me draw maybe something that might represent the protein packages. And so they get stored in there, right? It, it's a packing company, so to speak, right? So the Golgi bodies, they modify, they sort out, they package proteins um, that eventually get delivered within the cell, that get delivered outside of the cell, right? So pretty much it's, it, it's part, it, it, they're almost made by, by membrane of the, um, uh, this very similar to that of the, um, the cell membrane. So what happens is pretty much uh, a protein that gets on, you know, gets sent out. Oops, wrong color. 
uh, that gets sent out gets packaged in these vesicles, right? And these vesicles make their way towards, and they'll be throughout the cell, these vesicles um, that pretty much are storage centers, right? So they'll store um, material, right? They'll store proteins. And what's gonna happen here, let's say with this protein here, it makes its way towards um, the membrane, and then pretty much what it does is it fuses with the membrane okay. so it fuses with the membrane okay and pretty much it opens up part of the cell right but notice how this vesicle becomes a part of the cell membrane so notice it still keeps everything sealed but now it allows for pretty much the movement of this material outside of the cell okay so we've got here pretty much uh, what we call the vesicles um, that are in uh, they're very small in, in plant cell sorry in animal cells and let's go down to the animal cell sorry into the uh, plant cell here at the bottom it appears I have a bit of a lagging here with this uh... so what we're gonna do is we are going to draw our uh, Golgi bodies. Okay, so here we go. Uh, storage, right? Uh, and let's draw a protein maybe in there, right? That gets sorted, gets modified, gets um, secreted out, right? But within here, what's going to happen is plant cells usually have a very large vacuole. So pretty much they have a very large vacuole. Nutrients, waste, other substance uh, that pretty much the cell is going to use actually gets stored in this region here. So here, we're going to label it as a vacuole. All right. So um, plant cells have large, large vacuoles, while animal cells more consider, you know, the vacuoles aren't really considered, they're more considered vesicles and they're really tiny. Um, so, uh, plant cells really, one central vacuole stores the water that the cell needs, right? So water, when it enters a cell, this vacuole will swell up to store as much water as it possibly uh, can, which also gives the firmness to, um, to this plant cell, okay? So now, another really important part of, and let's try to get back up again, and let's look at the animal cell. Uh, very important organelle um, that um, you will be focusing on at the senior levels to study and its importance um, are these almost sausage-like um, organelles uh, that have the inside that look like this almost. And there are a whole bunch depending on, I guess, the type of animal cell, right? Some animal cells require a lot of it because it's got a very unique importance okay and these are considered the powerhouse of the cell and the powerhouse of the cell is called mitochondria okay mitochon I'm gonna put the singular version right mitochondrion this is singular right so um, it becomes mitochondria if it's plural, right? So one mitochondrion, two mitochondria. And as we said, the, this is pretty much considered the powerhouse of the cell. All cells require some kind of source of energy, right? And the, this mitochondria is what's responsible for forming the majority of the energy, right? So when, when our body breaks down glucose, right, we can produce energy, but there's an additional step that occurs within the mitochondria that allows us to make exponential amount of, um, of energy. And that energy um, that uh, you'll eventually study at the, oops, um, at uh, a senior level, oops, not really letting me erase it, oh well, um, is called ATP. And maybe at the junior level you might not need it, but ATP is pretty much the structure of energy that um, that you'll be studying in terms of what does the the mitochondria do and it makes a lot of this right this is um, 
pretty much the chemical energy that's found in, in the sugars that we eat, right? Glucose, very important uh, carbohydrate that we, actually, um, that we actually consume. And again, both plant and animal cells actually um, have these mitochondria. Okay, so the uh, both so both plant and animal cells need to produce energy, right? That's that's known fact, right? That's why you will find the mitochondria in both plant and animal cells. Okay, so here we've gotten, as we said, um, the mitochondria. Another thing that you will find um, in cells, pretty much both plant. Um, and animal cells and it's pretty much kind of part of these vesicles and what we're going to do is we're actually going to name one of these vesicles we are going to name it uh, let's draw a different one here if it's letting me draw it oh, there we go so let's draw it and we're going to name it a lysosome okay lysosome pretty much contain digestive enzymes Enzymes, enzymes um, are a chemical that helps speed up uh, some kind of process, right? It's a protein that speeds up chemical reactions in cells, right? Um, so if we want to speed up a reaction, we want to introduce an enzyme. But so there's an enzyme found in these lysosomes um, that help break down uh, material. Um, it also has the nickname suicide sac. Okay. It's got a nickname called Suicide, really uh, cool name, uh, I guess, whomever, <laughs> Suicide Sac. And what it does, really, it commits suicide to the cell. So if there's some invading bacteria uh, or some kind of damaged cell, um, this lysosome is going to break apart, secreting its enzyme throughout the cell thus killing the cell, right? Committing suicide to the cell to help get rid of um, this foreign body. Okay. So now let's um, look at uh, the plant cell now. And oh, actually, let me, uh, before we get to the plant cell, um, pretty much, let me just kind of, as we said, everything inside that is surrounding all these organelles, this, right, as I'm coloring in in, in yellow, this is considered the cytoplasm. Okay, so that jelly-like uh, substance that we talked about um, within, the, um, uh, within the plant cell and the animal cell. So let's uh, look at uh, another distinct characteristic uh, that is only found in plant cells that is not found in the animal cell. And pretty much one of the most important differences between a, um, a plant cell and, um, and an animal cell is the following, right? Let's face it, plant cells, they grow where they're growing, right? Uh, we are hungry, we go to the refrigerator, we get food. We go to the mall, we get, you know, some food. We go to the, the supermarket, we get food. But plants, they're, you know, they're very unique and they're pretty much, they're stuck where they're located. And so they have this green substance, these green organelles, right, that have packages um, pretty much of, um, of thylakoid, Right, that uh, allows them pretty much to, um, you know, produce their own energy, right? Their own energy. So we've got something called chloroplasts, right? So here we have chloroplasts, right? And these chloroplasts pretty much only found in plant cells, Okay, and pretty much these organelles, as we said, only found in plant cells, some algae, right? There's a green substance within. This is what's responsible for photosynthesis. So it's the chloroplast that is responsible for allowing for plants to create um, their own food. Okay, so um, pretty much um, within here, right, the, whatever gives this green pigment, right? Uh, okay, this green pigment, okay is called chlorophyll, right? So this cl green chlorophyll uses pretty much the energy from the sun uh, to convert 
uh, the things it needs, right? We water the plant, uh, we expose it to the air, which has carbon dioxide that it takes in. And in that, in return, when it takes in the sun, uh, as rays, it takes in carbon dioxide, it takes in the water, um, it actually will produce sugar uh, in the form of glucose, and it will produce oxygen that we need. And this is the process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Okay. And this is a process very unique only to uh, plant cells. This is how they're able to take in uh, the sun's rays. Right. So here's our sun. Right. Take in uh, the sun's rays. Right. Using these, using the chlorophyll within the uh, chloroplasts to produce glucose, which is very important um, for the uh, the plant. We've already looked at both the plant and animal cell. And let's look at some of the differences that are actually between plant and animal cells. Right? Plant cells contain a specialized chemical compound called chlorophyll, as we talked about uh, before, a pigment that makes photosynthesis possible. Plant cells have a large central vacuole, as um, we've shown before, while animal cells pretty much have a lot smaller vacuoles. They're almost considered vesicles in, uh, in animal cells. Uh, some plant cells store energy in the form of starch or oil, such as cornstarch and canola oil, while animal cells store energy in the form of glycogen, uh, which is considered a uh, carbohydrate, or pretty much as lipids in the form of fats, fat storage. Uh, another thing, some animal cells have specialized compounds. Um, one of the examples here pretty much is hemoglobin that's found in red blood cells. Red blood cells, so a cell. Uh, which is a little bit different from the types of cells that I've shown you in terms of uh, animal and plant cell. And uh, cholesterol that uh, can be found in some other types of cells. And finally, animal cells have centrioles. And we're going to talk a little more about um, centrioles when we discuss cell division. Uh, so centrioles, they're paired structures that are involved in cell division. They're involved with the production of spindle fibers. And plant cells, unfortunately, do not have centrioles.